I would like to welcome up Ashley Kilroy again to the stage. All right, everybody, welcome back. I hope you had a nice break. Um, and Elliot, I think you let everybody know outside that this is getting started. So we are really fortunate to have with us Representative Ed Perlmutter. We're so excited to have him here today. I know throughout a number of these presentations, we've all, uh, well, we heard Mayor Hancock um, express appreciation to Representative Perlmutter for the work that Rep Representative Perlmutter has been doing related to marijuana. Um, and a couple other of the panels have um, spoken about him. So we're really excited to have him here. Um, Representative Perlmutter serves in the 116th Congress. He's proud to serve on three committees in the House, Financial Services, Science, Space, and Technology, and Rules. He is also a member of the New Democrat Coalition, which is focused on harnessing American ingenuity and innovation to create new jobs, greater economic prosperity, and a safer and more secure future for our country. Since 2013, Representative Perlmutter has been pushing to allow marijuana-related businesses and ancillary businesses in states with existing regulatory structures to access the banking system. Today, 47 states plus a District of Columbia, representing 97.7% of the population, have legalized some for form of adult, recreational, or medicinal use uh, marijuana. The Safe Banking Act, Act, the Safe Banking Act, is focused on taking cash off the streets and making our communities safer and providing the certainty, certainty financial institutions need to start banking, need to start banking legitimate marijuana businesses. So please help me in welcoming Congressman Ed Perlmutter to the podium. Ashley, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody, and um, it's great to be here. Uh, as she said, my name's Ed Perlmutter. I'm a congressman for the suburbs of Denver, so I uh, represent everything between Denver and Boulder, uh, west side and north side of the town. Uh, I've lived around here my whole life, and um, I supported the uh, initiative back in 2000, and, and most of you know that in Colorado, uh, our marijuana legislation really uh, was um, started by uh, initiative, by the people. And so it's been really uh, grassroots up to sort of legislation that has led to what we've done here in Colorado. In 2000, uh, we had our... Uh, medical marijuana initiative, which I supported. And then in 2012, we had uh, the initiative to uh, legalize for adult use uh, marijuana. That one I didn't. Um, but I knew from talking to my family uh, that it was going to pass, and it passed with a substantial uh, number of people. And at, at that time, I served on the Financial Services Committee of the Congress. So banking, stock market, uh, insurance, housing, uh, monetary policy generally. And uh, we knew, and Barney Frank, who was the head of the Democrats uh, of our caucus, we knew there was going to be a collision between what the states were doing, whether it was with medical marijuana or now um, fully uh, legal recreational marijuana, that there was going to be a collision between the federal law and the state law, because with Washington following right on the heels of Colorado and then a number of other states, the federal banking system was going to follow federal law. And as a consequence, as states um, by the people changed the law to allow for more and more marijuana use, whether it was medical or fully legal, that we were going to have a problem, that there was going to be a lot of cash that was created in the sale of marijuana, marijuana-related products, and it was going to be difficult to bank it, you know, to provide financial services. 
And so um, I undertook uh, a bill, which we now call the Safe Banking Act, uh, to try to normalize that situation so that if a business was legitimate in a state, that that business could have legitimate banking services. Well, um, at that point, the Democrats were in the minority, Republicans were in the majority. Uh, we had a chairman of our committee who in, so almost, uh, it was almost religious for him in his opposition uh, to marijuana, to hemp, to have just about anything that had THC in it. So he wouldn't give me a hearing, wouldn't allow for a markup of the bill, so we went to the Obama administration as did a number of, uh, I, I imagine, groups in here and saying, hey, we need some relief so that we can do banking. And we worked with a guy named James Cole in the Attorney General's office, as well as with the Treasury Department to try to come up with some system, some compliance approach that would allow for uh, businesses to be able to get banking services, which then became what was called the Cole Memo and the FinCEN guidance. And so those two, the Treasury Department, the Justice Department, uh, came up with these approaches as to how to bank, provide banking services despite the federal law and the, under the Controlled Substance Act saying marijuana, anything with THC is illegal for all purposes. So got those things, uh, some banking institutions, some credit unions, were willing to undertake sort of the compliance that we require of them to provide financial services. And that worked okay, even though there were very few uh, for a period of time, but there was still a ton of cash that was uh, being uh, created by uh, these sales. Colorado, we had a murder uh, over on the east side of town, a young guy named Travis Mason who had just come back from Iraq, uh, had two young kids, uh, was going to be in the Denver Police Department, had, uh, was in training for that, but he acted as a security guard at a dispensary across town, was murdered. Uh, there was a lot of cash uh, stolen. We still haven't found uh, the killer in that, uh, in that case. We've had armed robberies and other things that really, despite the Cole Memo and the FinCEN guidance, there was still so much cash being generated, it really was a target uh, for crime, for assault and battery, robberies, even murder. So we continue to press forward uh, with this bill. Still, we're given the cold shoulder by the Republican uh, chairman of the committee, uh, Henserling. But when Democrats won the House uh, this past year, uh, first bill up was uh, or we had a hearing, uh, Maxine Waters, the chairwoman from, from uh, California said, okay, put up or shut up. You've been saying this is a problem. Let's have some testimony. We had great testimony from the marijuana industry. We had banks, credit unions. Uh, we had the state treasurer of uh, California. Fiona Ma was one of our witnesses. We had law enforcement. We had minority uh, cannabis business owners saying, the need for legitimizing banking services. Past uh, the, the, we had the hearing, then we had a markup. We had all the Democrats on the committee, 34 Democrats, and 11 Republicans uh, voted for it out of the committee. So it was 45 to 15. So a substantial bipartisan vote of a bill that had been stymied for six years. Now re remember too, when we had the Cole Memo and the FinCEN guidance, those are just administrative actions. So the Obama administration had taken those actions. When Attorney General Jeff Sessions came into office under Trump, he revoked the Cole Memo. So the Justice Department said, we're not going to do that. We're not going to say that uh, if you go through these compliance hoops, no organized crime, Kids can't get their hands on marijuana. It's open and transparent so we can make sure there's no tax evasion and things like that, that the bank would be sort of low on the enforcement priority scale. Sessions revoked that. Uh, Secretary Mnuchin over in Treasury said, we're going to keep the FinCEN guidance 
in place because we will disrupt what is now a several billion dollar industry and will really put these banks and credit unions uh, in a pickle because they wouldn't be able to provide the, the services. So we passed this bill. Um, know that the administration is kind of schizophrenic as to whether they're going to support the marijuana industry or oppose the marijuana industry. Uh, we then start working, and I have uh, three primary sponsors with me. One is a guy named Denny Heck uh, from the state of Washington. Who's from Washington around here? Anybody come in from Washington? Well, too bad for your Washingtonians. Uh, oh, there, there's a Washington. So Denny Heck from Washington, and then two Republicans from the state of Ohio, uh, Steve Stivers and a guy named Warren Davidson. And they were our, the primary sponsors. I'd say Denny Heck and I, our primary concern sort of underwriting this bill was public safety. And Travis Mason is, is who we picture um, in terms of the public safety aspect of this. Uh, Steve Stivers, uh, his district has Scott's Miracle Grow. And many of you know Scott's Miracle Grow is one of the biggest uh, fertilizer companies in the country, New York Stock Exchange. And they realized that so much of their business was coming from marijuana operations, they wanted to make sure that they could continue to provide uh, services to the marijuana industry. And then Davidson was more of a libertarian bent, saying, you know, look, you know, why are we even regulating this uh, area at all? So the three of us, or the four of us, worked together. We ultimately, last week, were able to pass a bill, uh, 321 to 103. So it's 229 Democrats, 91 Republicans, and one independent uh, voting for something where not a single bill involving marijuana had passed or even gotten to the floor of the House since marijuana was made illegal in 1971. So this was kind of an icebreaker, uh, which now is going to the Senate, and we think will ultimately pass the Senate and get to the President. And we have our fingers crossed that uh, he will uh, support the bill and sign it if the Senate passes it. So it's the first of about four or five. Uh, there are many, many uh, marijuana pieces of legislation in the Congress right now, but they are, the others are sort of in different groups. One is on research and testing. Another is on uh, use of marijuana by veterans and PTSD uh, problems that they may face. Another is on taxes. And finally is the big package, which is on uh, descheduling or rescheduling marijuana and the criminal justice reform and social equity reform that would come from that. But the banking piece really is the thing that is the icebreaker uh, in all of this, because really no marijuana legislation had hit the floor of the House in 50 plus years. So we feel pretty good that uh, there is uh, bipartisan support for fixing the law so that the federal government catches up with the states. As Ashley said in her introduction, we now figure there are 47 states that have some level of marijuana use, uh, whether it's cannabis oil, um, for seizures, medical marijuana, or fully legal. But it's uh, about 312 million out of the 325 million Americans live in a state where there's some level of use. And we've, the, the federal government needs to catch up to what the states and the people have been doing over the last uh, 20 years in terms of marijuana regulation. So we've got a lot on our plate in terms of uh, what the Congress is undertaking. The first is this banking piece. The support has been really substantial. First, we had um, 38 attorneys general uh, supporting, endorsing the bill. We had 20 governors. We had uh, dozens of state treasurers so that they don't just get taxes paid in cash, that they can actually do it with uh, normal banking services. We had law enforcement. We had cannabis uh, industry uh, groups, minority cannabis, the Cannabis uh, National Industry Association. We had um, 
the American Bankers Association, the Independent Community Bankers Association, the uh, Credit Union National Association, the real estate companies, the insurance companies, uh, just a huge array of business groups as well as uh, public officials supporting this uh, Safe Banking Act. Uh, we think that that really will lead the way to other kinds of uh, marijuana legislation over the course of maybe this year, certainly next year, and, and after that. So I could uh, tell jokes. I can, uh, they're not very good. Uh, or I can take questions about uh, where we see all of this going in terms of the Congress. But uh, I actually, had we not passed that bill last week, I did not want to come talk to you people at all. Because I'd been saying, this is just around the corner. This is just around the corner. I know that there's substantial support uh, among Democrats and Republicans. It's just around the corner. Um, finally, we got to the floor and we proved that this, unlike a lot of things that happens in the Congress, even in the midst of all the impeachment stuff that was hitting the uh, floor of the House last week, we were able to pass this very bipartisan piece of legislation because folks recognize this is where the people are and we need to get the federal law to catch up to where the local governments, the states are, where the people have been for some time. So if you have questions, I'd love to, to uh, entertain them. Otherwise, you can have a long break. Hi, I'm Jillian Schauer. I guess I'm the lone person here from Washington. <laughs> um, I'm a public health consultant, but there are a lot of regulators in the room, and they have a lot of um, knowledge and lessons learned from their experiences. What is the opportunity um, for regulators to engage more with congressional leaders who are putting forward some of these bills, especially the bill on rescheduling? Um, what are some thoughtful ways that regulators could engage with you all? Uh, good question. So in terms of uh, helping us you know, design, because right now there are probably two, three dozen different bills that are sitting out there in those general areas I was talking about, research and testing, taxes, uh, and then the big descheduling, rescheduling, uh, different types of regulating the industry. Uh, Denny Heck, for your state, is the, the lead guy. And to the degree you have ideas or others have ideas, uh, you can kind of go through the list of people who voted for this banking bill and get a sense whether your member of Congress is interested or opposed. And they're all going to be interested. And any assistance you could give would be greatly appreciated. And I know Washington has come, the state has uh, a number of groups that have come to meet with me and Denny and some others to kind of give us you know, best practices, some ideas, some tips. And we definitely welcome that. Because now we're moving from the public safety, in my opinion, the public safety component of banking, you know, where I'm on financial services, Denny's on financial services. We're, we're moving now into more of the healthcare space or the tax space. That's not really our uh, committee or our specific areas, but uh, because we've been working on this so much, uh, we're going to be able to help others in the Congress, you know, design, refine their particular pieces of legislation. But the first thing that I want to see happen is this bill move through the Senate and then get to the president's desk. We think that there, are, uh, there have been good signs coming out of the Senate that indicate they're interested in moving this bill forward. Where there had been a lot of resistance, um, Senator Crapo from Idaho, which is one of the few states that doesn't have any marijuana allowed, although apparently there's going to be a medical marijuana uh, initiative uh, in the state of Idaho. Uh, there's some things in the bill that he's interested in. We added hemp. Because uh, for you know bankers generally, they're not chemists. They don't know. Uh, how much THC is in anything. And they would have a hard time, you know, determining what's hemp, what's marijuana, that kind of stuff. So even though the agriculture bill, McConnell added a, an amendment at the last minute last year to legalize hemp with THC uh, levels below 0.3%, if you're a banker, 
you don't know whether something has 0.3% or 0.31% or any of that stuff. So this bill is designed both for hemp and marijuana to create a safe harbor for the banks to say if they do business with a marijuana business or the, the landlord of a marijuana business or the lawyer of a, of a marijuana business, that just because they're doing banking services with that business or ancillary business, it's not proceeds of an illegal activity. Right now, the law, because of the Controlled Substance Act, says money from a marijuana business or that goes to the landlord or goes directly to the bank could be considered proceeds of an illegal activity, which then is money laundering. And that's what we're trying to do is create a safe harbor from the money laundering statutes. The businesses and the banks still have to ensure that there is no, they've still got to comply and say there's no mafia money, no organized crime, no cartel, that there are uh, precautions in place that kids can't get their hands on it, and that it's open and transparent so that we know if there's any kind of uh, skimming or tax evasion as well. So those, those compliance components are still there, but the basic is we're taking it out of the money laundering statutes just because it's uh, marijuana or hemp. But we do need your help. Anybody else? Uh, thanks for thinking my question. Uh, my name is Boz Yordanoff. I'm from Where are uh, you? right here. Uh, right here doesn't help me. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in Vancouver. Yes, sir. Uh, could you speak a little bit about the pathway that you see to legalization at the federal level, uh, whether that goes through first the legalization of hemp and, and how you see that playing out? And also, if you could give a little bit of a timeline, that would be helpful. Sure. Thanks. And so. Um, uh, the fact you're from Canada, that's another component of this that we didn't quite address in the Safe Banking Act as it sits and as it's come out of the House. I hopefully will fix it a little bit more in the Senate, which is what about money going back and forth between Canada and the United States where Canada has legalized it and we still have prohibition against it here in um, the United States. We need to normalize sort of that that flow of cash across the border. So, Ashley, will you remember, I need to talk to, to the Senate about that. that. Thank you for reminding about me. Um, the, the timing of all this is still kind of up in the air, but this is how I see it. So, the banking bill will move through the Senate, and to the, to the degree they amend it or change it, uh, we may have to have a conference committee to resolve differences between the House version of the bill and the Senate version of the bill. That'll probably happen over the next two, three months. We've, we've had encouraging comments from the banking committee chair, plus the fact we have hemp in there, and hemp still has trouble getting banked uh, all the time. We think that the majority leader in the Senate, McConnell, we'll move this forward. So we're hoping to see the banking bill move over the next three to six months. The other bills, I'd say the next one that has the best chance of moving forward quickly probably would be the research and testing uh, bills that really determine whether or not, you know, what are the pros and cons of marijuana, of hemp. So that could pr happen over the course of the next year. The rescheduling and descheduling, the really big bill that you're talking about, the legalizing, uh, I expect that the Judiciary Committee of the House of Representatives will take up a bit, there are two bills. There's one called the MORE Act, and I don't remember what the acronym stands for, but it's MORE Act, and the other one, uh, and that's by Jerry Nadler, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, the other is called the Marijuana Justice Act by Barbara Lee out of California. So those two bills are the big bills that really uh, deschedule, reschedule uh, marijuana and then provide for criminal justice reform because a lot of people have had marijuana violations, can't go to work for the federal government, whatever. There's a big criminal justice component uh, to those bills. 
We expect those bills to be heard by the committee and voted on by the committee by the end of the year. And then it will come to the floor of the House, uh, probably be voted on uh, by the whole House first three months of next year, I would guess. Now, whether the Senate takes it up at all is, uh, is a real question mark. But I think the House will address the research and testing pretty soon. I think we'll address the descheduling, rescheduling by the end of the year, at least in the committee, and then the House, the whole House of Representatives will address it in probably the first quarter of next year. Um, I don't know whether the Senate is prepared to deal with it. I, we were really worried about just the banking piece of this thing, but it, we seem to be uh, getting good signs that it'll move. I'm not sure what else they'll do over there, maybe the research and testing. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Congressman. My name is Betsy Cavendish. I'm general counsel to Mayor Bowser. So thank you very much for your work on this. Um, to add to your talk about public safety, we've had four homicides in the District of Columbia in the past year associated with illegal marijuana sales and lots and lots of shootings and gun violence. It's a cash industry, and so we really appreciate your efforts to get this out of being a cash industry. Um, and I'd be happy to give you fact sheets on that if that's helpful to you. I don't have yes. them in my hand right now. But um, to your list of matters before the Congress, I hope you could also consider lifting the rider, as the House has done, that prohibits the District of Columbia from having a le legal tax and sales regime. We think it would conduce greatly to public safety in line with your talking points on the banking bill. We appreciate your um, being an original co-sponsor of statehood. and continuing efforts to let us govern our own budget because Congress is really um, creating a problem for the District of Columbia. No, you know, no tax revenues, the violence associated with it, we just can't get in and have a regulated regime. And the mayor has a detailed bill that reflects the best thinking and experience of all the states that have already done it. It's a responsible regime and Congress is standing in the way. So was that rider on our last appropriations bills? The House just lifted it, and it's over at the Senate now, but um, we're concerned that the uh, idea of a budget bill that has, quote, no poison pills means the status quo would continue, and we don't consider the marijuana bill, the marijuana rider, a poison pill. And okay, furthermore, well, we shouldn't have uh, it at and all. And I'll talk to, so uh, often, and most of you know this, but uh, riders are added to different appropriations bills. Many of them are aimed at the District of Columbia because um, the Congress has some say as to uh, the laws uh, in D.C. Uh, certainly we will work with, I'll work with my appropriations committee for them to sort of stand strong on uh, eliminating that rider so that you all can do business as you see fit. Thank you. Okay? No, you're absolutely right. I think they're discriminating <clears throat> against the center of this room, so I'm sorry that they're not seeing your hand. Congressman, but I'll call on you. Mayor yeah, Sean go. Ford, Commerce City, Colorado. Who are you? Mayor Sean Ford, Commerce City, Colorado. Good to see you again. I want to thank you for all of your efforts. What we're seeing in our community is the fact that these organizations and these businesses are in our community. They're providing a service, but I expect them to engage the community and give back. It's really hard, uh, based on the laws, for these organizations to uh, provide support for Boys and Girls Club, Habitat for Humanity, veterans organizations, the areas where we need them to play a role. Drug-free programs in schools. Um, 280E, uh, uh, rulemaking 280E is having a huge effect on where they can put money into our communities and where they can give back. I think the banking issue is one thing. I don't think you can put uh, this industry back in the bottle. Um, so we have to figure out how to be able to make sure that these businesses can effectively help our communities in the areas where we need them to help our communities. And the other question I have is um, on regulation. 
it, it seems like after being at this conference for just one day, seeing that every community is trying to regulate in, in their own way, oversight, the vaping issues and what's happening from a health perspective. Um, we need to have some rules that apply to the industry, um, that the industry knows what they're doing, and we know what we can expect for product that's being moved within our communities. Thank okay. you. Good to see you, Sean. Um, so, sort of to the general point that you're making, I mean, here in Colorado, um, you know, by constitutional amendment, we give local governments a lot of authority uh, to do their own thing as it relates to, to marijuana businesses. And so, you, you know, you do get a little bit of a checkerboard kind of a approach as to how Commerce City may do something or Wheat Ridge may do something or some other community. And I think it's going to be state by state. There is going to be a lot of uh, different approaches. At the federal level, you know, it, we've made it hard for marijuana businesses to be philanthropic, to be uh, able to contribute to the different kinds of organizations you're talking about because the money's illegal at this point. You know, we've said under the coal memo and the FinCEN guidance that the banks who do want to provide services or the credit unions that do want to provide services, they go through these hoops, they're going to be low in terms of enforcement issues uh, with the Justice Department or the Treasury Department. But it still is difficult to take that cash and put it to charitable use. The deductions aren't there as well because you can hardly take business deductions for, the, for these various uh, companies. So you're right, the banking piece is just one. In fact, it's a very narrow component of all this. But uh, there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of force behind it to get it passed and to break the ice here, to break this log jam that really has been in existence since 1971. And, and uh, I appreciate, you know, your desire as a mayor to get, you know, more of your businesses to contribute to the different, you know, programs you want to provide in the city, the parks you want to build, and all that stuff. Um, we're work this is the first thing that's going to get to those things that you want. You know, to, to be able to, to bring the industry, you know, into the mainstream and to allow them to contribute to the, to the community with the, the resources that they have. So it's a good question. Um, keep an eye on this one because there are going to be a number of things right behind it. So I said the research and, uh, and study uh, is one thing. Uh, a guy named Earl Blumenauer, so do we have any Oregonians in the office? So Earl has been the quarterback of all of these bills. I mean, he really has been the guy who's been trying to uh, normalize all of this for years. And so he's sort of the center, along with Barbara Lee from California, of you know, getting the banking bill moving, getting uh, the research and development, getting the PTSD uh, legislation for veterans. Uh, but his, uh, he is the main sponsor, and it's his committee on the taxes and to provide real deductions uh, for marijuana businesses and marijuana-related businesses, which would then help Sean Ford over here in Commerce City so that his businesses could actually make charitable contributions and get deductions for it. So uh, I, I don't want to forget Earl because he really has been at the center of all this to try to get these things so that they all work together, the state laws, the local laws, and the federal law. Uh, Hi, sir. Bia Campo, Office of Marijuana Policy, City of Denver. Uh, you mentioned that um, in 2012 you were against Amendment 64, and now you were one of the champions at the federal level for legalization. Can you just tell us, like, how was your mindset and, like, what made you change if it just had to do with, like, the will of the voters or if it was a discontinued process of uh, construction of your opinion and how, like, what were the factors that played into it? Sure. That's a great question. Um, 
So in 2012, when we passed it here in the state, um, you know, I didn't support it. Uh, a number of my family members did. Uh, Barney Frank, the head of the um, Democratic Caucus and Financial Services, said, look, Colorado's taking the lead. You got to take the lead on this bill to get the cash piece of this thing uh, so it isn't a, isn't a problem. So I took it on, um, knowing full well that our state was uh, taking the lead on this, and I better take the lead. So I did it more from a business and a, a kind of representative capacity than, than a personal capacity. But there was some evolution uh, for me uh, just in terms of uh, one of my uh, brother-in-laws uh, was a senior uh, ski instructor up at Vail. And he'd been out in the sun for decades. And he developed melanoma. And um, then it spread to everything else. And the only thing that gave him any comfort and allowed him to have any appetite was marijuana. And in the last year of his life, uh, I saw that this was the only thing that helped at all. And then I have a daughter with epilepsy. We were really sort of at wit's end. She'd had it a long time. We tried all different kinds of medicines, uh, surgery to avoid the seizures, and none of it worked until just at the end, uh, right as we were legalizing it, a medicine did come out, but we were moving to marijuana and cannabis oil uh, to try to deal with the seizures. So I had two instances of a brother-in-law and a daughter where there was this medical uh, element to it all, which then it gave me a whole other perspective than I'd had. And then eventually, as other states started uh, either having medical marijuana or fully legal, we saw this, this problem with the cash just continue to increase. And I just knew we had to get this done. So there was a personal evolution, but there was the evolution as being a member of the banking committee or the financial services committee. We had to get this moving because people were getting killed. Good morning, Good morning. Um, Congress Ed. My name is Yadira Silva from the Denver's Committee Cannabis Equity Co uh, Committee. And uh, I'm here in, uh, in uh, representation of many Latinos who wants to come and be part of the industry. And I want to request some type of protection for our communities from being, um, from being uh, targeted. Yes. Um, we. Mm, from being we are taken out from our citizenships for being in the industry. So I know that is something within your schedule to do, and I will request that a, some type of protection for us so we can be also included in such a wonderful industry without losing our privilege as well. Okay. Well, there are about 14 questions in your question, um, and they're all, none of them are easy. Uh, Obviously, we don't want, we want to make sure that this industry is available to everybody. And within the, the banking bill that I just passed, there's a, there's a piece of it that requires the Federal Reserve to do a study to make sure that minority communities are not excluded from the marijuana industry, that the, bank, that the banking community makes sure that there is not discrimination. Your question is a little broader, which, you know, we've got all sorts of, um, um, you know, illegal immigration, I think, is, is, is kind of mixed into your question a little bit. And obviously, um, you know, the Trump administration and and Ed Perlmutter are very different on how we view, um, you know, issues of immigration. And uh, I think that we first make sure there's no discrimination and that the industry is open to all, you know, whoever you might be, white, black, brown, purple, doesn't matter, men and women. And then to make sure that um, we have enough people in the industry to do all the work that needs to be done and not to exclude anybody. So 
let's talk about it a little bit after the uh, this breakout session, and we can get to more specifics on that. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Thank you for um, taking time today. Joe Devlin, um, recovering a California regulator. I now work for a startup. Um, you've touched on this uh, a little bit around the periphery, but can you um, maybe uh, share your thoughts on 280E and is that conversation um, taking place inside Washington around the, the, around the banking bill? Yes. So 280E, again, um, at the center of that is uh, Earl Blumenauer. And um, I really, the Ways and Means Committee, uh, which deals with taxes and deductions and all of that, uh, is going to address it. He's a senior uh, member of that committee, and I think that will now move because it will, I think it will have a lot of business support as well as, you know, uh, regulator support, uh, taxing authorities uh, at all. So, you know, I, I don't know if I have the bill number. Uh, with me, but clearly there is a bill, and it's his to deal with 280 issues. And it, I think it will move along with this research and uh, testing. It, it'll be interesting to see if the Senate wants to expand the banking bill at all, because they can. There, there are issues of whether a, a matter is germane, you know, is it part of the subject matter of the bill or not, they have sort of broader uh, accommodation for what's germane or not. They potentially could add something like that to the banking bill. Uh, I don't know how they want to approach it, uh, but that's, that's a possibility. And we could, you know, maybe get the taxes and the banking done under one, one title. Anybody else? Well, I just want to, oh, somebody over here. Good morning, Henny Lastly with Smart Colorado. Thank you for your service. Um, as we've seen in Colorado, the um, Healthy Kids Colorado survey has shown a statistically significant increase in youth use around dabbing and edibles, which of course are high potent pot. Would the, would the house have any appetite to more of a phase-in process around banking if the Senate were to pass the, the bill in terms of perhaps looking at different products that the marijuana industry produces um, that uh, might in impact our young people. Thank you. Um, I doubt it. I think uh, we're going to look at the banking uh, piece as just banking, you know, that it's about cash. We want to get the cash off the streets. I'd say that's more of a local or a state government, and you know, not to pass the buck as to who determines how potent anything is, but I think that's going to be more of a state or local government uh, decision to try to regulate that and not do it through the banking system, but we'll see how the Senate wants to approach this. I know there has been talk about, well, shouldn't uh, we determine how potent something is and try to um, reduce potency. Well, under the federal law, you can't even study the potency. Okay, states can. So unless we add some component about research and testing, it's very difficult. And I'm not sure uh, whether we want to add that to the bank. I, I guess I'd be reluctant to add that to the banking bill. Now, if it's to say we want to add research and testing to the banking bill, I could go along with that. But to try to then set limits as to the potency, I don't think this is the proper piece of legislation for that. I think it's probably more state and local governments or a separate piece of legislation as to, I don't want to make the bankers chemists and have to figure out potency. That's part of what, we, I just want to give them a safe harbor so they, they can do banking. But I hear you. Yes. I know you kind of addressed this, you know, earlier, but just kind of curious about the future, what you see the future, um, you know, beyond the banking bill. 
as far as federal legalization. There's kind of a debate whether it should be on a state level, a federal level, and I know those are there's so many different factors involved in that. But what do you see as far as a timeline? What do you see really truly happening down the road for legalization? I think that it's it's going to be a, at least a couple year proposition to really for us to really refine and develop our thinking about legalization and whether it's going to be sort of a federal uh, regulation type of system similar to alcohol or whether we're going to have a state by state approach but we just say the federal government is going to step back and be hands off as to whether it's legal or illegal. We'll let the states do it. I don't think that uh, the majority of the House has even you know, gotten anywhere near trying to figure that piece out. It will start, this whole conversation will start in the Judiciary Committee uh, probably within the next month or two months with the Moore Act and the Marijuana Justice Act. The conversation and the markup of those two bills will be the real beginning of that discussion. But I think over, it'll be a course of a year or two for a majority of the House and a majority of the Senate to figure out what the overall regulatory structure should look like, whether it's going to be a national kind of system or remain a state-by-state -state kind of approach. Um, but I do know, you know, whether we're talking 280E and allowing for deductions, I know there uh, certainly are federal regulators that would also be interested in, in taxing the industry. So we'll see exactly how that, that unveils. But I'd say look over, uh, look at the Judiciary Committee over the next few months and see how that proceeds and then see how we look at it uh, on the House floor over the next uh, six months, I would say. But really to get to the full rescheduling or descheduling and overall regulatory approach, I'd say that's at least a year to two years off. Looks like there's one more and then uh, probably lunchtime break. Exactly. This is, uh, we only have time for one last question here. Heike Newman with the University of Colorado and uh, Anschutz Medical Campus. You keep talking about the research and testing um, initiative, and I was wondering if you could expand on that just a little bit more and maybe provide some information as to whether the single source supplier for research marijuana may be expanded so that researchers have more sources available to actually do um, clinical research. Good question. Uh, I think the goal would be to just open it up so that you all could figure out what's good, what's bad, you know, what is beneficial, how potent something is. So I would hope that we're going to be more than a single source. Let me see if I can find the bill. Mm, I don't think I have it, but it's, it's designed, I know, to really uh, allow an institution like CU or anybody, any other kind of laboratory to do the kind of scientific research that that laboratory feels it needs to do without, and, and try not to limit it. That would be my goal, and I think that's what the legislation is, and I'm sorry I don't have the particular bill, but not, uh, we want to broaden it so that we, there can be more uh, study of this than certainly has been conducted to date. And I think all of us need that from a regulatory standpoint. The industry obviously would be uh, benefited by all of that. So, you know, again, uh, as, as uh, Sean Ford said, you know, we're not putting the genie back in the bottle. Uh, we have t virtually the entire country uh, has some level of, of marijuana use and certainly, and hemp too. And so we want to be able to understand this product, this crop, this whatever, in a much better fashion. We want to be able to deal with the taxes on it. And then ultimately, uh, to this woman's question, we want to make sure there's, there's social equity and criminal justice reform as it, as it attaches to all this. My, my little part of this, the banking piece, 
has sort of been the spearhead to get this whole conversation moving where it's been very slow. And uh, I know I've had a chance to talk to a number of groups, not specifically regulators such as yourselves, uh, but obviously you're dealing with a new industry and the federal government needs to catch up to where you are uh, so that we can all work together as a team because the people have spoken. You know, this isn't like Ed Perlmutter, the legislator, says, we're going to have marijuana next week. Uh, the people of the state of Colorado, the people of Washington, the people of California, I think the people of Idaho, when they vote on it uh, this fall or next year, they're going to speak. So ours is a very uh, people-driven kind of approach to this, and you people have caught up. Now it's time for the federal government to catch up. We'll deal with questions uh, such as yours about potency and things like that, but we're just trying to get the cash off the streets right now. And, but that one leads the way to all of this other legislation that needs to catch up. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. Uh, happy to answer a few questions afterwards. And you and I should uh, visit a little bit more about uh, uh, minority communities uh, working in the industry. Thank you all very much. Um, all right, everyone, I really appreciated your comment about what can we as regulators do. So if you all want to get together and, and as a regulator, maybe get together and organize a letter um, to be sent in support of um, Congressman per Perlmutter's Safe Banking Act, we've got his um, assistant here, Ashley Verville, and you all can contact her. And her email address is ashley, A-S-H-L-E-Y dot V-E-R-V-I-L-L-E -L -L -E at mail.house.gov. Also, Mayor Hancock has organized, I think we had, Ashley, what, about 13 mayors sign a letter also in favor of the Safe Banking Act. Yeah, yeah. And so the, mayor, the mayor's got a couple of mayors already signed to that. If you have a mayor that would be interested in signing on to that, we could get some additional signatures and then reissue that. So thanks again, Congressman. Yes. Yes. Any of them have their state treasurers, attorneys general, mayors, or governors who aren't on our list. We'd love to get them on the list. Okay. So did you guys hear that? The congressman just said if, if you all have any other state treasurers, mayors, AGs, anyone in your district who you think would be interested in signing on to some of these letters that have already been issued and they could be reissued with those additional signatures. All right. Well, thanks again. We really appreciate it. All right, everyone, time for lunch, and we'll see you back for the next panel.